Hello, everybody. It's Dr. Kevin Connors again for Connors Clinic Live. And today we have a very special guest who is a longtime hero of mine. So I told him before this interview that I'm a little starstruck because when I first you know, graduated as a chiropractor back in 1986, I read a lot about this guest here, Dr. Ralph Moss. And uh, he literally was my hero. He was one of the only people that was um, maybe in maybe not in an opposing medical camp per se, like not a naturopath or not a chiropractor. So therefore, they're against the medical profession, quote unquote. But he was a PhD researcher, scientist, scientific writer. I mean, your um, list of accolades goes on and on and on. Um, so we're going to just jump in. You gave me the inspiration to, to uh, continue what I feel like was God's leading of me to help people from an alternative perspective with cancer. Um, you gave me the courage to stand up um, when it can be daunting sometimes. So how did you get into um, looking at other forms of cancer treatment other than standards of care? Yeah, I had no intention of doing that. And uh, I actually learned about a job opening at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in the Public Affairs Department. And I was a writer. I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be able to write for a living. It was a passion of mine from childhood, um, or, you know, pretty early on. And I loved writing, publishing, uh, seeing, you know, seeing what I wrote in print and so forth. So, I applied for the job. It was completely um, far-fetched in a way because I had just gotten my PhD from Stanford in classics. But in the course of the seven years that it took me to get the PhD, I, I, this, I realized that I didn't want to teach Latin and Greek for the rest of my life. I had done it. I taught at University of California and I was then teaching at Hunter College in New York but two things. One is that I wanted to do something more meaningful, or, and that's not the right word, but more, more socially conscious uh, with my career. And uh, I was interested in science, but I was interested in it, not in doing it, but in observing it, thinking about it, writing about it, writing about the scientists, all that appealed to me. And I got the job <clears throat> and uh, that, that was my spiel basically was, well, I don't know anything about science. So therefore I'm just like the people you're trying to reach. And there was a little truth to that. It was actually the same thing that Gerald Peel was sort of the founder of this science writing profession in America. He used that same spiel to get a job with um, uh, Time Magazine, I think it was, um, good humanities student and uh, can look at science from as an outsider, from the outsider's perspective. So it's a powerful combination if you have the ability to understand what scientists are doing, but you retain your beginner's mind or your layperson's mind. It's, you know, you're not in the game, but you're, you're closely observing the game. And I, even though I have now gone on and co-written and co-authored some, I don't know, 30 or 35 scientific articles, but I'm not a scientist. I'm really, I'm just sort of the, the person observing and judging and criticizing what other people are doing. So that's a unique position to have, I think, in the cancer field. And it does make it um, more appealing to the, to the reader when they're yeah. not here, when they're not maybe, you're filtering out the mumbo jumbo that um, the language of a scientist and yeah. put it in a layman's terms where they can feel like that it's better communicated to them, they can understand. Right, and all science writers do that. I think the difference between me and most science writers is I have, I have the freedom to criticize. Not that I'm always criticizing, but 
I have the freedom if I see something that seems wrong or or um, not logical or that omits critical pieces of information, I can say that and nobody can stop me from saying that because other than a, sh a short stint that I, I put in for three years as a senior medical editor at a, um, at a publishing company, a medical legal publishing company, I've basically been freelance uh, since 1980, since, well, actually since uh, the end of 77. And that's given me the, the, the freedom to be able to say what I want. And then of course, having a wonderful family, uh, my wife, uh, uh, we've been together, we started dating um, just this week in 1959, uh, my, my sixth, we went out on my 16th birthday and my children, my son and my daughter and their spouses and my grandchildren now. So, you know, I've had this amazing support group um, my wife made it possible for me to financially to be able to be a freelance writer, because as I'm sure you're aware, and as your listeners are aware, it's a very up and up, up and down type of profession. It's not a, um, not a stable income by any means. I mean, uh, if you're, especially if you're dependent on selling articles to magazines and newspapers, mostly though, I've published my own things. I mean, I, I went up until the, when was it? Maybe in 90, 92, we published our own first time we ever published our own book, Cancer Therapy, which was a guide to 102 different non-conventional cancer treatments. And that, that actually did very well. It was just the right moment in the history of publishing to be able to put out your own book and then have it be picked up by Barnes and Noble and and then Amazon and so forth. So that was very doable. And now we have our MOSS reports, um, which are uh, diagnosis specific reports on about 40 different cancer diagnoses, which covers about 95% of all the cancer cases in the United States and other countries. And we sell these on our website, mossreports.com. That's how that, and I also do phone consultations for the cancer patients uh, pretty much every day. I'll do one, try to do one. Sometimes I, you know, the demand is so much, I have to do two a day, which is, you know, pretty, pretty time consuming, but this is how we pay, how we pay the bills. Basically we, we, um, we help the individual cancer patient in this very difficult moment in their life, which is trying to decide on what's the best treatment. Should they take the conventional treatment? If they do, what could they do uh, alongside it in order to make the outcome better or the side effects you know, less severe? And, or should they be thinking about alternatives? And if they're thinking about alternatives, um, what's real and what's phony? What, who's real and who's phony? <laughs> And, you know, I've had 45, 40, 46 years now to think about this and to examine this and, um, and the luxury and the leisure to go all around the world, to look anywhere in the world that I wanted to. And, and uh, for instance, I, I made a first site visit to a clinic in 1976. It was, um, it was a clinic in Tijuana, Mexico that was using Laetrile and, and some other controversial treatments. And then uh, in the starting in the 90s, I started going to Germany pretty much every year. And I made 18 trips to Germany to study the medical system there and the, the, the use of complementary medicine. And also going then, expanding out from there to other European destinations. And then finally to China, I went to, to China twice and you know other, other many other places. Um, to try to see what other people were doing and what was the validation for what they were doing. And was this a place that uh, an American or an English speaking person would possibly want to go to uh, for treatment? And it's, it was a fa it's been a fascinating journey. And some of that you can capture some of the feeling of that it wasn't the trip that I took. It was a trip that my grandson Jacob took um, about a year or so ago to we, we sort of sent him to different clinics in Europe and then in the United States to talk to 
the doctors there about immunotherapy, immunotherapy. Um, and we produced, he produced a film called Immunotherapy, The Battle Within. And I wrote- I give you a plug for that film because that's on your website, it's available right. for people to watch an excellent uh, production. Yeah, uh, yeah um, thank you. Just a fantastic film. So I really encourage right. you to get on there. And it's a homemade movie, basically. I mean, yeah. Jacob hadn't made a movie before. He had he had some experience with sort of uh, collateral fields to that, but wasn't really filmmaking. So this was his introduction. He and his girlfriend slash fiance. I'm not sure which which one is the right term at the moment, but anyway, they went to Europe for our most reports, and then they introduced they interviewed all these people but for me although i totally am you know totally was involved in what all these people were saying but the real hero of the film was somebody who died about 80 years ago and that's william b coley and william b coley is one of my heroes and one of my inspirations um in life because um he was really the person who invented who first dared to use the immune system to cure cancer. And that's a, that was an extremely, um, an extremely controversial statement. I mean, if you said that to anybody, any oncologist um, 20 years ago, I mean, they, you would have branded yourself as a complete quack by, by doing that. Today, it's a commonplace. You see it all over the place. William B. Coley, the, the grandfather or the father of cancer immunotherapy and his progeny, if you will, intellectual progeny, uh, Jim Allison was awarded the Nobel Prize in, in 2018. And of course he wanted for his own accomplishments, but on another level, and I think I brought this out in the film, this was really a prize that went not just to him, but to his mentor, Lloyd, old and to Lloyd old and Helen, uh, mentor Helen Coley Notts and to Helen Coley Notts mentor her father William B Coley so there is a line of descent amazingly a line of descent within the field of cancer immunotherapy straight from William B Coley and what happened in the 1890s to Jim Allison and the modern day immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy that he invented and I tried to bring this out uh, he he wouldn't come out with a you know I interviewed him for an hour um, and it was a very good interview and we have that interview is on YouTube, but he never came out and said yes you're right I am the intellectual heir to William B Coley it was all like you know yeah but he didn't say this and he didn't say that and so forth but to me it was obvious and I wanted to tell that story and that's the way I see it I mean I see. I studied history. Look, I mean, that's what classics is. You're, you're deeply immersed in things that happened 2,500 years ago. And, uh, and so to me, it was the historical connection with William B. Coley was the very, very strong point. And I want, I, I can't still to this day, wrap my head around a situation where a person, let's say an oncologist, uh, knows and acknowledges that this man, William B. Coley, cured advanced cancers 100 and 110 and 120 years ago using a very simple treatment, um, a, a, a mixture of two bacteria that had been killed, he killed, and then was injected into the patient. <clears throat> and they kept that up for a number of months. And the net result was that hundreds of people were cured of advanced cancers by him doing this. So and sure. I'm going to interrupt you for a second for some yeah. for listeners that may not yeah. remember this story. That was called, he called that Coley's toxins. Yeah. Um, and the purpose was to basically inject an attenuated bacteria that um, would stimulate an immune response. And his whole idea, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, was if he could just stimulate a hyper immune response to something the immune system no longer would have to kill, it would then turn its focus on other things in the body that maybe need to be killed like cancer. 
And yeah. he was right. And it worked. And, it worked. And, uh, and I'll let you continue. So Coley's- Yeah, very, no, well put. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it, it was attenuated, but it was also killed bacteria yeah, because was, he had tried, he started yeah. out using live bacteria and some people got very sick, some nurses and so uh, forth. So yeah, that was not, yes, uh, yeah. was not tenable to use an infectious agent, but it was, the body sees a killed bacteria like a, a massive infection. It's sort of like a false alarm sure. that's, that brings out the entire, you know, why you know uh, still uh, an uh, antigen that that it's stimulates. still the that's antigen true. of the bacteria is yeah. is the same thing so the body sees it as a menace and goes after it and so it's in a way like sort of like a vaccination the interesting thing is that coley and i i haven't double double triple checked this but jim allison told me that coley never actually explicitly made the connection to the immune system which is interesting coley just knew from a very, very special case. We have a picture of the man that, that who was that case. And we even know who, what his name was. And uh, this man had ha had four operations for uh, head and neck cancer and it had recurred. And then he spontaneously developed a skin disease called erysipelas and um, the cancer, the erysipelas went away eventually and the cancer went away, never recurred or it didn't occur at the time that Coley uh, uh, looked for him. And Coley went all over Manhattan and he finally found this guy who was a German immigrant and um, Mr. Stein, his name was, and um, brought him back to his mentor uh, at uh, New York Hospital. And the man was free of cancer. So that was where he got the idea that um, they knew that erysipelas was caused by strep bacteria. And then uh, he started to give uh, under the aegis of Memorial Hospital, Memorial, what's now Memorial Sloan Kettering, to give that as a treatment. But all he knew was erysipelas, which is a horrible skin disease, really. We don't see much of it because it's cured with antibiotics now, but it's a horrible thing. And uh, if you got that horrible thing and you survived and you had cancer, there's a good chance your cancer was going to go away. I'm not off, I'm not suggesting that your listeners <clears throat> try to pick up a, a case of er erysipelas, it wouldn't be, it, it's pretty nasty. And anyway, it'd be cured with, with, with um, antibiotics. But the principle was there. He didn't really understand it. Honestly, he was a surgeon. He was a practical man. He was an extremely busy man. Uh, he had a number of other um, outstanding careers in um, different kinds of surgery. Um, but he, but he was able to do this thing. He was able to cure people, but it it, were, it remained for his daughter, who was not a science, not bred, not um, you know educated as a scientist, to uh, turn her attention to after he died to what it was that made him so unique, made Coley so unique, and what it was about the treatment, what made the treatment successful, and that was a tremendous achievement. It basically. It took her um, 35 to 40 years of research into his cases. Uh, she as assembled all, all of his cases that she, she could find, all the cases of people who had been treated with the Coley's toxins and all the people who had got spontaneously developed, uh, what would you say, uh, fevers and, and infections and what cancer patients and what happened to them. And these were put into monographs, the most boring format that you could imagine. Um, she did never sensationalize, you know, she did everything by the book because she was the daughter of a famous Memorial Hospital yeah. surgeon. And she desperately wanted to have uh, acceptance by the medical establishment. But um, she got a little bit of that, but did not, she didn't anticipate that her one of her, her uh, intellectual heirs, Jim Allison, was going to win the Nobel Prize. That would have been very, very, very satisfying to her. Right. I knew her quite well. That's great. Well, she just put, a, put her case studies together. Absolutely. And that is research, unfortunately, that has 
been much ignored by the medical profession. Oh, I always, and even, and, and it's all just honored in the breach or whatever they say. It's it's just given lip service, and nobody takes it seriously. And the books are actually, I have a set, but the books are in danger of actually disappearing off the face of the earth. There's there's only a few copies left. Um, I know a couple of people who have copies, but. This is a this is why I wanted to make the film because I could not in good conscience just go on knowing that there was a, a cure for various you know people with cancer that existed and not shout that from the rooftops. It's just unconscionable. But it, you know, so I hope everybody will come to our website, which is mossreports.com, and right up at the front, uh, we've put the link to the film. It's free. And, um, and then also my latest book, um, Cancer Incorporated is also available in, in the electronic version, it's free. And then you could also buy a print version for not very much money. So I, I would say, you know, we're trying to get the message out here and we don't wanna let, we have to, of course we have to make a living too, but we're not we don't wanna let the, the practical, practic practical considerations get in the way of, this tremendous social duty that we have to uh, let the world know what has actually happened vis-a-vis -vis the, you know, what we used to call alternative medicine and so forth. Well, that's why I've respected you for all these years. It's just that you, you've uh, lived from your heart and, and um, felt like there was a greater responsibility than the dollar. And, uh, you see, I write a lot about publication bias in my book and how it's difficult to even trust studies and drugs today because they might put it out for a study to 12 universities. Yeah. And they only publish the two that came back positive. Um, it's just, it, it, it's the, would you say you've been an independent author? I don't know how many there are out there that exist anymore. Um, the, right. the people are bought and sold like commodities. Um, you know, yes, granted, we everybody has to pay their bills, but then this misinformation takes place, and um, it's it's very difficult for people to really get at the truth, to dig to get at the truth, and we see that yeah. going on today even more right. than ever. So, well, you know, I when I started out, I published with very good publishing companies. Um, Grove Press was my first publisher. I was very proud to be associated with them. And then I published with HarperCollins, with, with Dial. When I, I had a contract, I didn't publish with them, uh, but with, um, with uh, uh, Bantam, with uh, many other, uh, Doubleday. Uh, so I, I, you know, I did all those things, but at a certain point, I realized that I just didn't fit in. And it wasn't that the, that the editors were particularly prejudiced for or against, it's just that it's not commercial. What I do, it's, um, you know, if you wanna do something commercially successful, you have to hype something, basically. I mean, the days of being able to get, you know, really vigorous sales with a critique of the, the establishment went out. Um, started to go down in the 1980s and by about 1990 it was pretty much dead you couldn't uh, you know uh, you could not really get any traction with that both the public taste changed and the, the there was more consolidation in publishing and the editors seemed to be more conservative so 1980 when I published cancer industry that was sort of the high point and you had other people who were critics uh, quite a few of the cancer establishment, you had some pretty high level people like Sam Epstein, who wrote The Politics of Mandelson. Cancer. Mandelson was another one. John Baylor, who had been editor in chief of the Journal of the National Cancer Institute. Um, yeah, I mean, I could, you know, if I thought about it, I could name half a dozen other people, many other people who were doing similar things. And there's some other very talented science writers who got into it and then just fell by the wayside for very, for one reason, you know, usually for some personal reason and it had stopped being commercially viable, you know, so it kind of left, left the field to me and I just am obsessed 
<laughs> so you know, it's not a fair, it's not a fair, a fair competition because I'm literally. Let's see, I was, I was up from three to five this morning, uh, revising my Moss reports. I mean, any, I'm obsessed. I, any moment that I get that I can work on my my writing and my, you know, this this now voluminous body of of work uh, that I've done about the, the cancer topic, I'll do. And I can look at myself and say, that guy's crazy, but, you know, at least I have enough uh, distance, but it's a good crazy, you that's know. That's why I love you so much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I've published all of my stuff self-published because I want yeah. to give it away. So uh -huh. right. it's like, you know, publisher is not going to let you do that quite so no. easily. So. Yeah. Well, I just thank you for this interview. I thank you for telling me, you know, telling our listeners a little bit about you. Um, um, as I told my staff, I was interviewing you. I was literally, like I said, starstruck. And, uh, <laughs> and I want more people to continue to know what you do in this age of cancel culture. Um, uh, we got to get the word out and the truth out uh, so people can hear these things from an unbiased point of view, like yours, it's it's great. Um, just giving people opinion and some facts and some data that they can chew on and help make help them be able to make the best choice possible for their healthcare. Because to me, that's what it's all about. It's that's people, all it is about. People being able to make their own choice and not being right. forced to do something they don't want to do. Um, right, and I, at one time in the 90s, you know, I had the dream of being able to sort of help direct government policy to make the, to make this happen. Um, it was not possible. We we had we formed the Office of Alternative Medicine uh, with two million dollar uh, allotment from the Congress for thanks to Senator Harkin, um, and it's now the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. They got rid of that alter that a word, <laughs> the alternative word. Um, but there was a split within the 18 person uh, panel that I was on. I was on on the Alternative Medicine Program Advisory Council, and the split was over direction, of course, whether to take the most controversial things uh, that the public was most interested in and evaluate those things fairly, honestly, without prejudice and let the chips fall where they may. That was my position, our position. Mm -hmm. I, I not, was not alone in this. We had about, oh, out of the 18, we probably had um, six or seven of the 18 who were solidly behind that proposal. And that wasn't mostly because of me, it's mostly because of Berkeley Bedell, who was a six term congressman from Iowa, who was highly supportive of that position. And then you had the other people who, um, whatever the reason, uh, believed that what should happen is the money, there wasn't much money at that point, but whatever money there was should go to the most prestigious university you could find to do studies that were peripheral to the controversial treatments and just sort of nibble around the edges and let the field get established. And in time, those other, you know, <clears throat> controversial things could be studied. Well, we both were right in the sense that, yes, it grew to, a, I think it's $144 million, uh, which is a nice piece, chunk of change uh, uh, for studying alternative complementary medicine, but the studies of the controversial treatments never happened. In other words, what was uh, agitating the public at that time? Uh, Brzezinski's treatment in Texas, the antineoplastons, Laetrol, or so-called uh, vitamin B17, the Burton method in the Bahamas, um, uh, vi intravenous vitamin C, all these things that were enormously interesting to the public were completely off limits in terms of the academic medical establishment. And what they wanted to do is what came to pass. In other words, they set up a uh, alternative complementary or integrative section at Memorial Sloan Kettering, my old alma mater, and at Harvard and 
ever, and, and all the other pretty much across the country, the more established and more prestigious, the more likely they were to set up a, a complementary. And in those places, basically the whole, this enormous field that 102 different treatments I talked about in, in cancer therapy shrank down, kept shrinking, shrinking, shrinking until basically it became acupuncture and massage. That was it. That was the, to the totality. I mean, they're nice things, acupuncture and massage, nothing wrong there. And Memorial did some good studies in terms of um, acupuncture, very valuable, I would say. And they have some very fine people. I'm not, I'm not in any way denigrating the people. They're nice people and, they, and some of them have done good, good work. But you couldn't touch anything that anybody in the establishment of you know any importance had ever said anything negative about. You see, that's what it really came down to. That if so and so, who was the, the head of the American Medical Association, said that Hoxie's herbs were crap, pardon the expression, you couldn't go and even say, you know what, we should study those Hoxie herbs because. Morris Fishbein or somebody of his, oh. uh, of his equivalent uh, uh, status had already told you that those were worthless. Why would you want to study that? And, and I saw this in action. I won't name, I'm not going to name names. I could, but I, but I won't. But one of the top officials of the Office of Alternative Medicine, which, was, which they located in the office of the director of the NIH, um, he to keep an eye on it uh, and and he was called to a meeting with the man who was then the director of the NIH and he went in and he was a he's a great guy I'm still in touch with him this not the not the head of the NIH but the the official at the office of alternative medicine now the NCCIH and in the course of the interview the director of the NIH said well, what do you what do you want to do? What are you working on personally? What's your interest, and what would you like to you know to study? And he and the guy, in, without thinking, speaking from the heart, as you said, said, "I actually want to do scientific studies of homeopathy." And the reaction uh, was so so strong and so severe. Like, why the hell would you want to study homeopathy? You know, it's worthless, it can't work, it's too diluted, blah, 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 the usual party line about homeopathy. And the, this official came back, we were having, in the, this is in the midst of a meeting that we were, ha uh, because we had, we had four to six meetings a year. I went, to, I went down to Washington like 30, 40 times in part of this process. And he said, I think I just, did myself out of a job. He had a contract, like a one year or two year contract. He said, I think I just did myself out of a job. I said, what do you mean? He said, um, they were, I, 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 he told this story and he said, they, you know, I, I had just had that strong feeling I'm never going to be rehired here. He's never worked for the government again. The day that his contract was up was the last day that he ever worked for the government. And he's gone on and had a glorious career in in the NGOs and in other other things, and he has a, he has his own medical practice, but that was the literally the kiss of death, and they can do that. Sure, they can do that, and you nibble. You know, you're going to nibble around the edges of this incredibly enormous field of medicine, but you'll never get to be a player in terms of the, you know, setting policy or being able to move the direction. The only way you can influence this, this behemoth is to mobilize public opinion. That's the only power that you have in my, this is my experience, you know, and that's, that's unfair <laughs> to put it mild. It's not just unfair to us as activists or as would be reformers, it's unfair to the patients because look, you're asking cancer patients to be the activists who are gonna make change and fight for freedom of choice and all these things. They're going through the hardest time in their entire lives and, and the caretakers are going through, You know, sometimes it's even harder on the care, caretakers, caregivers, whatever you wanna call them. 
So it's a very difficult situation because the, you know, this, this um, juggernaut rolls on and we are just sort of the bystanders and we're yelling out and saying, look, this is wrong. This is not going the right way. You're not doing this right. And especially, you know, you could use these natural treatments in conjunction with the, if you want to, in conjunction with the conventional treatments. And there's an abundance of evidence that there's a better outcome if you do that. And you're ignored. It's no, and, and the patients, and, and believe me, 50, a good 40, 50% of the patients are asking the doctors, can I use supplements or can I do this or other, you know, complementary treatments along with these highly toxic, destructive treatments. And they, they're almost always shut down or at least I never hear about um, people being the whole heart, you know, even being treated respectfully. It gets to the point where you don't, you know, I under, totally understand this that you don't even want to bring up the topic. I don't bring it up with my own doctors because you know, you know you're going to be shut down. Right. And it's, it's, it's humiliating to be in that situation where you're treated like an idiot. If you, if you say, but doctor, what about if I were to do uh, some intravenous vitamin C, for instance? Now we have clinical trial data about the effectiveness of vitamin C in one kind of cancer, a very difficult cancer. You will be treated like an idiot. I mean, the the I hear this from my I do phone consultations for cancer patients. I hear it all the time, mm-hmm. all the time. I never hear maybe that maybe this is election bias going on here. But the people come to me, I hear horror story after horror story about how people are treated by the oncologist. And and these are lovely. The oncologists can be lovely people, but I tell them that's as long as you don't cross them because they are they are nice people as long as you're doing what they believe to be right okay or even if they don't believe to be right as long as you do what they tell you to do sure and what they and most of them they are the most blinded people i know the oncologists are they have blinders on i mean all professions do i think uh, to a certain degree they are self reinforcing without a doubt okay and there's also jealousy, they don't want others to poach on what they consider their field. They want to have the monopoly, you know, as a group. But um, basically, uh, they, they don't want to hear anything coming that's not sanctioned. And what does it mean to be sanctioned? Well, there's a whole elaborate structure that's been created that involves hundreds or thousands of people. This is not a little cabal. This is a, a huge profession, gigantic profession. Their meetings have, there are 25,000 people in the day, in the pre-COVID days would come to Chicago for the ASCO meeting. I mean, it's unbelievable event, okay? But, you know, basically it's a, it, it's, it's like the, the poet Philip Larkin said that the, the widest prairies have electric fences. So, at the end of that wide fence where the, everything goes and we can, we're intellectuals, we can examine any question, you know, the BS that you, that you hear, but there's always an electric fence at the end that, that defines what's acceptable discourse. You know, they, the way they call that the Overton window is another name for it. Mm-hmm. And, and so they, um, there's, a, there's a limit. And I, in my opinion, that, that electric fence has been shrinking and shrinking and shrinking over the years. Um, they're very, they're very ossified. The, the oncology profession in their beliefs and in what they, you know, and how they and how they approach cancer. It's uh, it's very limited. Their their the mental framework that they operate from the uh, the Overton window. Some people call that. It, it's um, it's a very small, very narrow. Uh, thing, you know, it's everything from, you know, all their choices from A to B, basically. Right. And, and so uh, you don't have a, you can't break in to that narrow professional circle that ASCO, uh, American Society for Clinical Oncology and these other groups represent you. It's just, it's just a, a, a mindset. And it reminds me a little bit of, um, 
of the church in the late Middle Ages. You know, uh, when, when the Inquisition, Inquisition didn't start in the days when the church was ascendant. The Inquisition came in when the church was already feeling the pressure mm-hmm. of modern that science. They had to buckle down on it. Abs- absolutely. And that's how I, that's the, the that's how I Galileo feel. with the, Ab- death. the stretcher. Absolutely. Okay. Right. Worse than, it's... worse than death. Right. Absolutely. So I feel like that's sort of the age we're in. We're in the age where a lot, uh, you know, we're breaking out intellectually from the bounds, the binds of the conventional way of thinking about cancer. So much has come out that just threatens to destroy the uh, conventional uh, strictures on on one's thinking about the cancer problem. But at the other hand, the controls have never been greater than yeah. they are now. So it's a it's an immovable force versus, you know, a, um, a, a, a an immovable object versus an irresistible force. That the force is there, it's gonna push through, but there's tremendous amount of of resistance to it as well. And um, you know, I'd love to to say that I, you know, I'd love to live long enough to see this field of complementary or integrative oncology triumph. I I've seen wonderful things happen, but you know, there's still tremendous resistance to it. It isn't going right. to happen so quickly. And, and it's in the practice of medicine as a whole, not just oncology. I think it's right, right. I see it more so during this time than anything. Yes, but it does take, and the reason why you're my hero is it takes that those courageous few to stand up and scream the emperor is not wearing any clothes. Yeah. Um, when you're going to get the criticism of your peers and of general population and yeah. the media now, and you're going to get smeared on social media and right. everywhere else and canceled on everything. And it takes a courageous person to stand up against that. And um, so I applaud you. Thank uh, you. And I want to really encourage our listeners. We're going to have it up on this on the screen when we get this video done on uh, your your website to purchase your books to support your work. Thanks. Uh, it's more support. Most important. Mm-hmm. So important. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I'd love to have you on again sometime. I know you're a thank very you. busy person. I appreciate this. I well, thank you. Such thank a you. Blessing. We'll talk again. Thank you. I appreciate all your work. Thanks. And we'll be back in touch.